All right. I won't jinx you then. Looks like we're on. All right, I'd like to uh, call the uh, Plymouth School Committee to order at 7 p.m. Would you join me in um, the Pledge of Allegiance? <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would ask also that you um, uh, join me in a moment of silence for um, Kathleen Thompson. Um, Kathleen Thompson was a main office secretary, served Plymouth Public Schools for 25 years. She worked at Mount Pleasant School from September 17, 1988, and retired December 7, um, 2013. Kathleen um, passed away on May 9th um, of this year, and please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, next up we have comments from community members. Please come up. You do a fourth for the record, can you state your name and your address please? Yes, Sandra Brogan, 15 Trina's Path, Plymouth of course. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, we live here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I've been before you a couple of times recently and um, urging you to bring the golden rule back into school, to treat others, to teach the children, teach the young people to treat others the way they would like to be treated. Um, I've also brought in the Geneva Bible, uh, which was the very Bible that the pilgrims brought over on the Mayflower, and I would just look if you look behind our uh, one who's, in, who's presiding tonight, um, the sign, Plymouth Public Schools, Making Dreams Come True. The Mayflower is riding on a book. It came in. They came, the pilgrims came in with a book, and they came, their book was in their heart. It's the Bible. Um, this is, um, the Bible has so much for us, tales, t stories, truth, and yet we don't really embrace it as a society. And I'm urging us to bring it back into the schools and you know, talk about it and learn from it. And, um, and what it does also is shows what's right and what is wrong. And this is something that's going on with our society today. We, children, people don't know what's right from wrong. They see things in movies, it's okay, we have revenge. We're gonna, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. No, we're supposed to be able to forgive people and to love people unconditionally, no matter who they are, no matter what they're doing. And I, you know, this is what I'm, I'm striving to do and have learned. I was a school teacher for many years, uh, 40 altogether, 37 in my own classroom. Um, I was one of the teachers who took the Bible out of the classroom. And it wasn't because I was against the Bible, it was just that, you know, I, I was a young teacher, I had a lot of other things that were kind of very important, and I just took it out. I think I probably took it home and put it on a shelf there. But I took the Bible out of the school. So I would like to see the Bible come back into the school. I would like the golden rule um, in school. And maybe instead of the DEI um, uh, person that you're going to do, the diversity, equity, and inclusion person that you're, you're considering, um, Let's see, there was just one more thing. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Um, but we do, oh yes, the Israelites. A lot of the stories in the Old Testament are about the Israelites, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, God's people who he loved. He loved them so much and he, he wanted them to be blessed. And he told them, he gave, and I sp spoke about this before, you can be blessed or you can be cursed. Choose blessing, God says. You can have life or you can have death. Choose life, he says. But they chose the wrong way. They, they put other idols and things before him. They went away from him. And when that happened, um, then they went into captivity. They went into captivity, and it got worse and worse and worse until they cried out to God. And any time you cry out to God, God help, please. He helps. And um, I am very grateful. I've had so many things happen in my life that that God has answered amazing prayers. 
And he saved, as I said last time, he saved me and my family from death several times, um, different situations. Um, let's see. So um, the captivity, oh, we got time up. Time's up, but you can finish your point. Thank I don't you. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Um, the Israelites went into captivity. Well, we've been in captivity. We have had masks. We've had social distancing. Don't hug your relatives. Don't come near them. Don't come together for Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, you know, your holidays, that you, whatever you're celebrating. And this is captivity, and we don't want it. We need to come back to God. And the pilgrims did that and that that they are our role model as far as i'm concerned people come here because of the pilgrim story and i just want to encourage us to come back to to god and the pilgrim story and to uh to loving people and forgiving people rather than saying oh you said this you're fired you know that's what i'm concerned about with the dei person you know so so thank you so much thank you for your comments thank you Next up, we have our student representatives. So we'll start with Catherine from um, Plymouth North. And she's not here. She's not here. So we'll go to Justin from Plymouth South. All right. Um, so we encourage everyone to come attend the musical Chicago this weekend at PSHS. It's the first musical we've had since COVID. Um, and our students are extremely excited. It will be Friday and Saturday night, both at 7 p.m., and it's $5 um, ticket purchase. Beginning May 31st, the class of 2022 is invited to visit their um, Plymouth Elementary Schools, and uh, the dates are posted on the school's social media, and it has been emailed to students for a special graduation walk in their caps and gowns as our elementary students and staff share words of encouragement and loud cheers. Wednesday night is the CCTE Senior Showcase, beginning at 6.30 at PSHS, Seniors will display their portfolio, portfolios for their families. Uh, we had the junior prom on Friday night. It was an Indian pond and it was a huge success. Um, Nathan Wolfgang Wood was crowned king and Raina Butler was the queen. Our top 10 breakfast for seniors, uh, for senior scholars and their families is this Thursday at 9 a.m. in the culinary um, classroom. And then the Senior Athletic Awards Night is at 6 p.m. on Sunday, May 22nd. We look forward to celebrating all, um, all senior athletes at this event, as well as any sort of special recognition awards that students may have earned. The band concert will also be on May 25th at 7 p.m. Um, at Self. Our sports teams are having a great spring so far, and we're hopeful that the warm weather will stay with us. Colby Consolati and Alyssa Briggs were honored at the league dinner as scholar athletes. And last week, South defeated North in an exciting come from behind the extra innings baseball game, 3-2. Uh, it was a great day on campus seeing lacrosse, baseball, and softball, and tennis um, all on campus competing together. Our senior week festivities are almost ready to go, including scholarship night on June 1st, uh, the senior dinner dance on June 2nd, graduation rehearsals, class day on the 27th, and finally graduation on June 4th. It's hard to believe graduation day is almost here. Uh, congratulations to the following seniors who placed, or st following students uh, who placed at Skills USA States on Friday. Um, Taylor Bruzzi received a gold medal for action skills. Ryan Olson received a silver medal in medical assisting. And Taylor will be heading to Atlanta to compete in nationals. Great job to all the students involved. And uh, lastly, Panther TV news. We recently found out that the team has received 11 National Academy Television Arts and Sciences Boston and New England Student Production Awards, uh, Emmy nominations. These winners, uh, the winners of these awards will be announced at the ceremony on June 14th. Additionally, the team just won first place all New, um, all New England for the high school newscast for the New England uh, Scholarship Pre or Scholastic uh, Press Association along with 10 individual achievement awards. Um, please see the Facebook page for details. Thank you to our teachers, Mr. Gelder, Mr. Smith, and Mr. McNamara for their efforts. Thank you, Justin. And if Dr. Cameron wants to come up, we'll... Sure, so, um, and, and we, Catherine did confirm, so something must have come up and we'll follow up with, with her as well, but Justin, it's you being a senior this year and graduating, we just wanted to thank you and recognize you um, for all your support and commitment to, uh, as a student rep here at, at the school committee, we have a certificate for you. Uh, we want you to take your um, nameplate as well, that's for you to keep. Um, but you've not only have you been a great contributor to the school committee, in my opinion, but also I know the work that you've done as an intern for PYDC and your involvement in the in in, in the school um, 
in general has been spectacular and Justin's going on to study in Florida. We just had a great conversation about um, the universities going to. So but we just really want to you know, show our appreciation uh, to you, Justin, and wish you well. So I don't, know if the, I don't know if the committee wants to get up and take a photo with him. We could do that, too. Oh, yeah. Happy to do that. <coughs> Happy to take that photo? You want to take it? Uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, it's, uh, Fort Myers. <laughs> That's where I'm from. There he is. Oh, really? <laughs> Excellent. And it looks like, Adam, you're going to be reporting for North tonight? Yes, I'm sorry I'm late. I was at a fundraiser uh, for student council, but I just need to pull it up and then I'll be ready. Yeah, right take, right. take your time. Thank you. Okay, congratulations to our student council elected winners for next year. Class of 2024 president is Sean Coleman, vice president is Lily Johnson, and secretary is Jack Corby. Class of 2023 president is Lucy Woomer, vice president is Brenna Giuliani, treasurer is Juliana Andrews, and secretary is Jordan Sherman. E-board president elect is DC Brown, Vice President is myself, Adam Halperin, and Colin Chamberlain. Treasurer is Eric Godle Godleski. Secretary is Scarlett O'Farrell. Publicity Coordinator is Lila Tossi. Historian is Mia Vagnini. And then the two liaisons are Morgan Rodden and Molly Flynn. Also, congratulations to those selected to the board for class council. Senior families, yard sales for pre-order only can be picked up Wednesday, May 18th from 3.30 to 5.30 in front of the school by the main office entrance. May is Mental <coughs> Health Awareness Month. School adjustment counselors will be at various lunches during the month sharing information about upcoming events. Students that would like to get involved in leading mental health initiatives next year are encouraged to join. The math team competed in the state math meet for the first time ever and ended the year as division champions. Also a first for this year, the math team seniors served as teaching assistants during math lab, which was a major help to students in all math classes. 83 Plymouth North math students participated in AP mock exams on Saturdays and after hours to prepare for AP Calculus AB, AP Calculus BC, AP Statistics, and AP Computer Science Principles. We are very proud of our teachers and students for going above and beyond the scope of the high school curriculum to challenge themselves at the college level. The Foreign Language Honor Society has elected new student leaders for next year. We look forward to working with Brian Lehman, who is the French co-president, and Yuna Yi, who is the Spanish co-president. Additionally, pending a change to our bylaws by our membership committee, we are hoping to be able to offer vice president positions for both languages to the two runner-up students who ran for FLHS leadership this year. Plymouth Public Schools is working in conjunction with the Plymouth Bay Cultural District and the Center of Active Living to offer an intergenerational poetry project with the theme, Tell Your Story. Students have met with Plymouth Poem Laureate uh, Stephen Delbos and members of the Center of Active Living to attend two poetry workshops, and the final one was today. Students discussed and wrote poetry and plan to present it at an open mic night in a few weeks. Three teachers from the history department at Plymouth North recently took two conflicts classes and one international relations class to JFK Library in Boston. Students worked with primary source documents to further understand the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Space Race, and the Berlin Crisis. Time was spent afterwards viewing the JFK Museum. 
some upcoming VPA events on May 18th. The PNHS Orchestra and Band Concert will be at 7 p.m. in the PAC. And on May 20th, the Spring Acapella Festival will be at 7 p.m. in the PAC. And then lastly, check out, um, check out Principal Parsons' parent page for any upcoming important event dates. Thank you, Adam. Next up, do we have uh, an update on the redistricting, Dr. Campbell? Yeah, thank you, and, and, and anyone else who is part of that can uh, chime in. Just to give an update to the committee, so our working group met on May 12th last week, taking into consideration all the feedback that we've received from both the community as well as from the redistrict, our last redistricting advisory committee. We had some great conversations there. So we've made a few uh, versions or revisions to scenario one to look at additional options that we will eventually be presenting to the community. Um, we've also started looking at the numbers for grandfathering to know what that would entail, should that be something that is considered so we know exactly what we're dealing with in terms of you know, um, what that would do, the impact that it would have. Uh, based on those different scenarios. So that's information that's very helpful as we go through this process. So we'll be sharing this work with the redistricting advisory committee early this week. Um, and I think um, we need to have the goal of, <coughs> excuse me, presenting the revised options to the community at large in the next couple of weeks, I think, would be good. There's a lot going on right now. Um, I think we have activities seven nights this week. So I don't want, I don't want the presentation to get lost in, uh, in everything else that's going on. So my recommendation in terms of timing would be to wait until to make any final recommendation here until the last meeting in June. Um, I don't think we need to rush anything, um, but if we could do it by then, I think we have plenty of time to gauge the public, to communicate these revised scenarios that we've been looking at um, and get some additional feedback before making some final recommendations. So uh, we'll send a very specific communication uh, to any neighbors and neighborhoods that um, may be impacted by some of these adjustments so that they have ample time at, um, to know when that presentation will take place as well. So that's what I have this evening, Mr. Morgan. Excellent. Thank you for that update. Um, now we've got some program updates. Uh, I guess we'll start with um, director's update from EdTV. Yes. Brian. Tonight we have uh, Mr. Byrne who will be um, a very impressive presentation on educational television here in Plymouth. Setting the bar high. It's, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, well, my name is Brian Byrne. I know I've kind of met all of you throughout, throughout time, um, but this is actually my first school committee presentation in front of you guys. Um, so um, I just wanted to start off tonight's um, presentation with a quick video that was made by um, one of our editors, Seth Sprague, that uh, kind of encapsulates all, all the things that we cover here um, in, in Ed TV. So uh, it's about a two minute video. So um, Seth, if you want to cue that up, we'll start with that. Ready, Plymouth North. Good morning, Plymouth South. It's time for Falcon TV, Dag TV, Panther TV, PNN. All this was so much more. Right now on Ed TV, Ed TV, Ed TV Kids. Welcome to this week's edition of Week in Review. I'm Delilah Coleman. I'm Katana. I'm Fernandes. I'm Kate. And I'm Taylor. We are honored to present the industry award to Kaylee Elgar and Taylor Jenkins.
right, so I, I just have to start by giving a shout out to Seth, who's downstairs switching this whole show right now. He put together that whole video, um, and it kind of encapsulates uh, everything that we do. Um, you know, we're we're out there filming events, we're we're teaching students in the studio. Um, and all of this couldn't happen without my team. So, um, Seth, if you could just put that uh, slideshow up. All right. So this is this is my team. Um, we have six members, uh, and we kind of cover everything that there is uh, going on in our district. So. We have Evan McNamara, who um, takes care of a lot of our secondary schools. So he uh, works at both North and South, um, as well as PCIS and PSMS. Um, we'll jump a little bit more deeper in the, into all of our programs later on, but uh, he's kind of our secondary specialist. Uh, Jen Mulvaney is our elementary video specialist, so she covers all eight of the elementary schools, which is pretty remarkable. Um, Emily, Emily Goonan is our communications director, so um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Emily and all that she does. She's constantly going to all different events, photographing them, and then communicating all of that out on all of our platforms. Um, Seth Sprague is our video production specialist who uh, created that video, and also he's also the person who switches all of these shows as well. So um, he's downstairs right now. And then finally, we have Libby Hurley, who's our Ed TV reporter, who does a number of things. So she uh, will assist at all of the levels, whether that's high school, middle school, or elementary. And she also produces her own show called the Ed TV Update, which kind of encapsulates things that are going on in the district, and it's a bi weekly. Um, quick little um, video that encapsulates different things going on. So uh, despite kind of all of the things that are going on in the district, we, we were able to capture all of that stuff with, uh, with a team of six, which is truly remarkable. Um, let's see if this thing wants to switch over. Okay, so I'm gonna go back one. All right, that jumped on me. Okay, so I'm going to start at the elementary level. Um, at EdTV, we have, we have three things. We want to educate, communicate, and entertain. And we put educate first because we are student first. And we want to make sure that our students are getting the most video opportunities that they can within the Plymouth Public Schools. So we're able to start them um, right in elementary school with um, Jen Mulvaney's programs. And that's all part of a program called EdTV Kids. So each of the eight elementary schools all have a uh, news broadcast um, program. Uh, and so these kids are learning how to write a news story, how to cover a news story, how to interview, um, how to also um, get the presentation skills so that they can they can present in front of a camera and so forth. So um, it's it's a great program that we run, um, and then all of that culminates in uh, the Ellies, which is actually tomorrow night, uh, where we'll actually celebrate all of these um, uh, elementary journalists in a in, in a great kind of celebration of all the stories that they created throughout um, throughout the whole year. So that's the elementary school. At the middle school level, we, uh, we exist in two clubs. So we have a club at PCIS called Falcon TV and a club at um, PSMS called JAG TV. So these, again, are both broadcast journalist programs. Um, so we just want to give that opportunity so that students, when they finish in fifth grade at elementary school, they have programs that they can then participate in middle and then in high school. So these are kind of those in-between programs. And again, these are run by um, Evan McNamara and Libby Hurley. So these meet once a week, and they're able to produce um, shows. And they also get other great opportunities where the school might have an event going on, and we'll actually be able to do a, a live event shot of that. So they'll get to physically be switching different cameras, communicating to all those um, camera people and so forth. So it's a great experience to kind of get them uh, involved in all these different video events. Um, at each level, we try to celebrate all of our students in kind of an end, end of year uh, celebration. So at the middle school level, we actually have an event called Premier Night. And the whole idea behind Premier Night is to celebrate the students, but also give them a view into what kind of opportunities they have in the future. So a, a lot of times we try to bring in a industry professional so that the students can actually interact with them and get an idea of, okay, what can I do in the video industry? Because there's many different things you can do. You can go into news, you can go into film, um, whatever it might be. We want to kind of open those students' eyes to all of those opportunities. Um, then at the high school level, um, our, our two big programs are PNN and um, Panther TV. So PNN at North High School and Panther TV at uh, South High School. So these programs have um, existed for a little over 10 years now, and um, both of these programs are, are nationally known. 
Um, and PNN has actually now won for the best news broadcast in the entire nation twice, which is a pretty amazing feat over the past 10 years, um, most recently in 2019. So um, they've been able to develop these programs um, with, with great teaching support. It's beyond just my staff for that. Uh, we also, what's cool about these high school programs is they're actually English classes and we pair a um, English teacher with a uh, TV specialist. And so then they're kind of getting best of both worlds. They're getting the technical aspect as well as the, um, the, the written and, and so forth. Um, so those are our, our two big programs there. Um, another program that we, or another class that we began this year with um, Evan was a uh, intro to broadcasting and television production. So with the amazing facilities that we have, I'm sure you guys have all been through North and South High School, we have state-of-the-art TV studios, which is not too common in high schools nowadays. So it's really important that, that we felt that we teach these students how to use that TV studio and, and really bring these experiences to them. So we started this class this year and it's been a great success where it's a freshman sophomore class so students can, can jump into the studio and do all sorts of live productions. Um, and they've actually kind of been involved um, in, in live productions for the school. So like class day coming up, uh, all these students will be involved, hands-on, switching live cameras, filming with these live cameras and so forth. So that's been a, a great experience. And then the final piece of our high school level is our student film festival, which I'll actually jump into um, in, in the next couple slides. So in terms of uh, communicate, jumping into our second goal here, um, these are kind of a, a br smaller list of, of the many things that we do at EdTV. Obviously, we cover school committee. Um, EdTV Update is that show that we were, um, that Libby produces uh, bi-weekly, kind of encompassing what the district does. Um, our Student Film Festival was a, um, a program that we started about three years ago where we wanted to give, you know, students a chance to be creative and also share their, their creative spin on whatever the um, topic might be for that year. So that's been um, a tremendous success as well. The, we also have a summer camp as well that we've been running, um, or pre-COVID we were running that um, for many, many years. Um, in terms of resources that we provide to the, to, beyond just the students, as I mentioned, we're students first, but we also provide services to our teachers as well. Um, we saw a, a big hit during, during COVID, obviously, where people needed to involve video in their curriculum and so forth. So we were, we were definitely taxed a lot during that time period, but it gave us the opportunity to kind of see what teachers need and how they want to integrate video into their curriculum. And then we were able to provide those services as kind of a support services. Um, so we actually created a video request form that allows teachers, if a teacher wants to incorporate video into their class, they can go ahead and fill that form out and then we can kind of support them or showcase their students however they're looking um, to make that happen. Um, moving on, I, I want to, for the entertainment piece, I want to kind of take this back because um, we haven't presented here since uh, since probably 2019, 2018 potentially, um, I wanted to kind of do a little timeline um, over the last couple of years. So um, these are some of the big projects that we've done over the, over the last three years or so. Um, back in fall of 2019, um, obviously we moved to this beautiful uh, studio here, um, which I think was, was a gr tremendous upgrade in terms of over, over what we, were, we had over at PCIS. So it's great to be here and I hope you guys are all enjoying the space as much as we are. Um, in 2020, the winter of 2020, that's when we first started our first film festival. Um, and so what we did was open it up to students grades six through 12, um, and they were given a topic, and then they were to produce a uh, film around that topic. And it could be anything in a narrative category, journalism category, or a 60-second uh, short. Um, so just a couple weeks ago, we just finalized our, our uh, third year of that film festival. And I know that some, pe some of you here judge those films, so we appreciate uh, you for participating in that piece. Um, and we just found that to be a, a, a great opportunity for our students to express themselves um, through, through video. Uh, moving on, in spring of 2020, um, we all remember where we were at that time, uh, and uh, EdTV was, was, was in overdrive at that point. Um, obviously, that, that demanded a lot, of, a lot of people wanted to stream their events, and uh, that springtime, we actually uh, streamed over 20 remote events um, live to the Plymouth community, as 
whether it be on our channel or online. Um, so we found that that was a great opportunity to kind of still showcase our students, celebrate our students um, through these remote events. Um, moving into the fall of 2020, uh, we teamed up with um, Carolyn Rains to kind of create a little mini series about uh, how we could keep our community healthy amidst the, the, the pandemic. Um, so that, that was a great kind of collaboration with our health department to make sure that we're pushing out the proper information um, and everyone felt safe to, to come back to school in that, in that fall period. Moving into the winter of 2021, we did a really cool series called the Story Corps where we actually teamed up with the Center for Active Living and we did, um, we did uh, remote interviews. So we did interviews over Google Meet and so forth um, with members and we were able, they were able to tell their stories to our, um, whether it be elementary or middle school journalists. So it was a really cool project to kind of bring those two generations together and, and share their stories. And, um, and the, kind of the theme was that of that project was um, really just take the time to listen because it really provided our students an opportunity to, to hear from, from another generation of kind of their experiences in Plymouth and so forth. So that was a great event. Um, moving on to the spring of 2021, we broadcast live um, the Coffee House from Brewster Gardens, um, which was a unbelievable event. Um, kudos to the VPA department for putting that on. And that, that was such a great event to kind of bring the community together, um, coming out of kind of the pandemic and starting to be able to come together. That was a great opportunity to broadcast that. And um, another great piece of that was that so many people were tuning in online because that foundation had spread so much. So that was a great opportunity to share kind of the voices of Plymouth and, and the amazing talents that we have. Um, Moving on to the fall of 2021, so this previous fall, um, a, a really cool project that we worked on was um, the CCTE montages. So obviously we have many uh, VOTEC programs here at um, Plymouth, and so we were trying to brainstorm ways to kind of showcase those those um, those different programs to our middle school students, because a lot of times it's tough to just come over and, and see that program for 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever it may be, and know what it's all about. So we created a series of videos and we teamed up with our, um, our uh, students over at South High where they actually created many of those montages. So it was kind of a students who will then be passing on that knowledge to other students. So it was a, it was a really cool video project to have those students produce many of those. Um, moving on to just, uh, what was that, two weeks ago now? Um, we held, held our uh, annual premiere night for our middle school students, um, where uh, this picture right here is uh, Sabrina, who she's actually a um, producer for Good Morning America, and she's holding up her uh, Emmy there. And so uh, we had her come and talk to our uh, broadcast journalism, middle school broadcast journalism students. Um, which was an amazing experience for them to kind of ask questions, you know, what, what does it take to be in this industry and so forth. So um, that was an amazing experience that, um, that our students got to have just a couple weeks ago. Um, so moving on to our production. So this is kind of a, uh, an overarching list of all the different things that we cover. I won't go through all of them, but this uh, pretty much encompasses everything, whether it's, um, you know, uh, concerts or uh, curriculum events, um, sports, um, whether it's district updates from from um, Dr. Campbell, it could be really anything. We, we cover anything video within this district. Um, and as you can see, moving on to kind of our videos produced over the last um, five years, it's only been going up. Obviously, right now we're, we're in FY22 and we're already at 7.05 and we still have about a uh, month and a half left. So um, we'll probably be surpassing that thousand number and which is truly an amazing number when you think about there's 181 school days in a year and we're producing just over a thousand videos. Um, and that encompasses all of our student work as well. Um, so we, we, we really take pride in kind of producing that number but also producing quality videos at the end of the day too. Um, Moving on to um, talk a little bit about the Cable Advisory Committee. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Cable Advisory Committee here in Plymouth. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give a quick shout out and I left a little card for each of you here, but 
The Cable Advisory Committee is currently running a survey for all Plymouth residents right now. Um, we are about to renew one of our cable contracts. And so the um, goal behind this survey is to get your input and to get Plymouthians input on what how, how our cable services are providing um, our residents. So I really want to encourage um, any Plymouth resident to scan that QR code um, or you can uh, text survey to that number um, and you'll be able to take the survey. It, it shouldn't take any more than five to 10 minutes. Um, and it'll be extremely beneficial to the Plymouth community as we start to negotiate that contract with, with our uh, cable providers here in Plymouth. So I did want to mention that. And then um, the final piece um, that I did want to mention as well is, uh, as you may know or, or, or may not be familiar with, but cable um, is starting to dwindle a little bit. A lot of people are starting to cut cable and moving towards those streaming services. Um, we at EdTV are solely funded off of those um, the, those funds from the from Comcast and Verizon. So obviously as those subscriber numbers are going down, um, so is in our funding. So um, it, it's kind of something that we've started to become aware of. It's why this survey is important so we kind of see where the trends are going. Are Plymouthians moving towards streaming services? Are they still sticking with cable? Um, but this is a bill. Um, there have been many other um, communities within Massachusetts who have started to been being hit with this cable drop. Um, and their, their local access channels are struggling. Um, so what this bill is, this bill is currently um, being presented, um, and we won't know any more until about uh, the summertime. Uh, but basically, this is a bill that will essentially do what cable funds do right now, but for streaming platforms. So those streaming platforms are using those same rights of way to get that content to um, the people of Plymouth. So the idea behind this is that any um, streaming business that is is making a certain amount will then pay that 5%, just like the Comcast and Verizons do to us right now. Um, and so that is a potential um, option coming up. Um, just wanted to know, we've gotten great support from everyone here in Plymouth. Um, we've gotten it from the Board of Selectmen, um, have endorsed it. Uh, Representative Miratori, Representative Lanatra, Senator Moran have all signed on to this bill as well. Um, so this is something that um, is important and the Board of Selectmen are going to write a letter in recommendation for this as well. Um, I urge you guys as well, if you would like to discuss it as a committee, I'd love if you guys would be open to writing a letter of support for this as well, as it could benefit kind of all of these programs that I discussed um, will only benefit from something like this. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions? Any questions from committee members? Comments? Excellent presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Next up, we have uh, media and technology. We have uh, two, um, two presentations. We're going to invite uh, both. Uh, our, and, and Kathy, when was the last time that you came? Before? Did we introduce you when you first came on board? OK. So Kathy, we're our new technology coordinator who isn't that new anymore, um, and Alan McLean, who you're all familiar with, um, will be co-presenting this evening. Right, so we can't have a tech presentation without the toys, so I'll be breaking those out soon. Um, those of you who know me, my name's Kathy Ware. I'm the new coordinator of Education Technology, Instructional Media, and Library, and I want to thank you for letting me come and present some of the things that we're doing. So it's been a very busy but very fun school year so far. Um, I'm really enjoying my first year here. So I'm just gonna get started right away with who's who, who does what. 
Um, there have been quite a few changes with the staff in both the elementary level. There's been one change in the secondary level, but just so you have an idea of who's who. Am I supposed to press something? All right, so. I'll also do it here. This is something we'll be talking about later. Okay, so first of all, now the most interesting part of the slide is probably their Twitter handles. Um, the librarians, um, library technology specialists, the technology integration specialists are very active on social media, so you can see all the really cool things that they do. Um, so first we'll start with the elementary library and information technology specialists. Now, a few years back, they joined the two positions where it's not just one person teaching technology, one person teaching library. Now, the two positions have merged. So, in Cold Spring, we have a new person, Stephanie Grindle. She is, she's, been, she's taught for many years, and she's a great addition to our team. She's very much a go-getter, loves trying technology, and was a coach for the elementary, elementary robotics rally. Um, at Fed Fern, we have Federal Furnace, we have Lori Ashley, uh, very innovative, loves to try new things. I even had a full set of Spheros I was going to show off, but she already asked for them and is already using them in her library settings. So I said, here you go. I'd rather it be in the students' hands. Um, next at Hedge, we have Deb Newhouse. Um, she's from Florida. She's a wonderful librarian. Wonderful in understanding technology and how to teach the technology and really works with the kids to kind of get them to understand and become excited about the technology and the library itself. At Indian Brook, we have Kathy Gravel and Stacy Burton. Both of them are great with working together and great on focusing on both the technology and library skills. At Matamut, we have Anne Marie. She's kind of taken on a whole new light where she's getting very excited about using technology. As you'll see in one of the slides, um, how she joined the whole aspect of um, one of the books and creating a whole scene. The kids learn how to program the dashes to create a scene for one of the books. It was really cool that she put together. Um, Nathaniel Morton, we have Kristen Guevara and Kevin Tui. The two of them work hand in hand. Um, they've, they kind of bounce back and forth between running the library and doing the technology but sometimes you'll see them team teaching, sometimes you'll see them working separately, well, they'll take one set of kids and focus on the tech, take another set of kids, focus on the library. Um, and then at South Elementary, there's Christy Godfrey and Michael Albert, we, call them, we all call them Al, and what they do, like Christy's really focused on the library, and oftentimes, same thing, because there's two people in that position because the size of the school, they will often switch back and forth, um, trade kids back and forth, and sometimes they'll just teach the whole class together. Um, and then West Elementary, we have Jolie. She's very strong in the technology. She's absolutely wonderful, and she supports all of the other lits in guiding them through using the new technology tools. So next is our secondary technology integration specialist. These two roles are still sep are separate. Um, so we have a new person at Plymouth South for our tech integration specialist. We kind of stole her from Plymouth North. Um, Karen Morrell, um, she is absolutely wonderful. She's really getting into using the tech. She's learning how to manage everything. Um, and she's really getting into the classroom and is very excited about like showing the teachers all the great tools that we have. Next is Kelly Oliver. She's a librarian. She also runs the library. She manages all of the Chromebooks that need to be handed out. Um, she also, like, and both of them teach a, teach a class as well, which I'll go into later on. At PCIS, we have Becky Hamill as a librarian and Carrie Cameron as a tech integration specialist. Both of them work very well together. Every time I've gone in there, they've been team teaching. Um, then one group, will t one set will take a group, and the other set will take another group. It's been really great to watch them work together. Um, so the tech integration specialists both te all teach eighth grade digital literacy, um, as well as the librarians. They manage the hardware with the help from Alan's team. Um, they assist with the technology needs, collaborate with, and guide the teachers in technology integration and leveraging digital. At the high school, we have Jeff Hudson as our tech integration specialist. He is great with technology. You'll often see him running around, helping the teachers out, guiding them on what to do and how to use everything. 
Um, we have Linda Harding as a librarian. She will often find her with the students, um, putting books away or just interacting with the students who are in the library. Every time I've gone into that library space, there have been at least 35 kids that magically just show up when the bell rings. They all stand up and they go out and do what they need to do and, and she manages all of it. Same thing with Justin. Justin often goes into the classroom. Um, I've often seen him collaborate with the classroom teachers and team teach with them. And Judy, who's in the library, Judy, Judy Debonese, is in the library and she has kind of created different programs for the students to kind of develop the library into more of a learning <coughs> commons and give the students who say aren't in all the technical classes a chance to kind of try it out. Uh, both of them have started using different tools like a Glowforge um, and kind of creating it more of like a makerspace, a learning commons, and just a central hub of the school. And in addition to that, the librarians manage the school libraries, maintain the collections, ensures that the stacks are in order, um, circulate print, non-print, and hardware materials, including Chromebooks. They oversee the students working at the library at all times. They've, like I said, they develop maker spaces. Um, they brought in the glow forges. Um, they also spend a lot of time collaborating with teachers to focus on um, teaching research and research skills. And I won't go, and they, they do a whole lot more, but I could be here all night talking about it. <laughs> so if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so the agenda. Um, I know, I didn't list the first thing on the agenda. So first thing is the six C's for deep, lear deep learning and leveraging digital. Um, the elementary school, building the foundation. That's where I'm going to start breaking out a few toys. Um, high school, middle school, reinforcing the skills. Um, STEM, AR, VR, MCAS website, and libraries. As, as you can see, we've added the libraries to this. Okay, so the first thing um, that I always like to focus on is the SAMR model for teaching technology, where technology is not, not really a, it moves away from being a substitute from what everyone's actually using it for, and kind of redefines how the students learn. Now, a lot of focus in, lever in the SAMR model and leveraging digital is the six C's for deeper learning. So when we think of it, at first, the 21st century skills for deep learning or the 21st century skills are the four C's. This kind of adds a few more. So there's care, I won't go over what all of them are because well, <laughs> I could be here forever. Um, character, citizenship, collaboration, communication, which is very helpful with EdTV, creativity, and my, my, my favorite, critical thinking. So when, we first, when I first say deep learning, you'll probably hear me say that a lot. So the whole idea of deep learning is the quality of learning, it's the quality of learning that sticks with students later on in life. For example, um, I'm, I'm speaking this from my own personal perspective. I am not a math person. Um, I don't math, I can manage budgets, but realistically thinking and thinking about math, I don't math. Um, so students may not remember when or how they learned how to divide decimals. I realized I didn't when I was trying to show my daughter how to do it. Um, I use a calculator all the time, but they would remember when they had to create a business plan for a food truck and follow through the process of everything needed to start that business. So those are the kinds of, that's the kind of learning that sticks with a student. And one of the major aspects of deep learning is leveraging digital. As you may notice, I use the term digital in place of technology to signal that we are not focused on the digital tools themselves, um, but rather on the role that interaction with digital can play in enhancing learning. Um, effective use of digital facilitates the six C's that I just mentioned um, with students, families, community members, and experts regardless of geographical location. So one of the things that you would also see is when the eighth graders were learning about, say, a different location, they were able to pull someone up almost as like a, a webcast where they were able to communicate with experts in their field. So let's say, so the Let's TIS's librarian role and librarian role has become one of ensuring that students have the skills, competency, and competencies to discern critically to discern, critically evaluate, discover, and create new knowledge in innovative ways. And I'll be showing that a little bit. Um, the students can then use digital to engage, motivate, and amplify their learning. And this moves the students from being consumers of the knowledge and consumers of the technology um, 
and actually applying it to real world problems. So the next part, is, so it kind of like ties in with our goal to graduate confident critical thinkers, that's the term, um, productive and learning lifelong learners and socially responsible engaging citizens capable of adapting to change in technology and advance in the multicultural society, which we've seen quite a bit of just this past year and a half. Um, so for the next part. Okay, so elementary schools. So back in 2019, um, the Library and Technology Integration Specialists got together um, because that was when they started to join the two roles. Now, what they did, they weren't quite, a lot of people weren't, weren't quite sure what the two roles joined actually looked like, um, but I was able to come in, but fortunately, I have done both roles. I've taught both roles, and I've taught both, both roles at the same time. So. One of the challenges was that there were individuals in the district who excelled in teaching technology, while there were others who excelled in teaching library and research skills. So the main question was how to join the two content areas so they can be taught as one class. When fall started, they were able to begin figuring out the, so summer 2019, they started to develop a curriculum for this. Um, when fall started, they were able to begin figuring out how both roles work together and teach within the scope of the library technology of librarian and technology teacher. Unfortunately, they didn't have a whole lot of time to figure this out because six and a half months into this, COVID hit. And everything changed. Um, and even when fall started, they, uh, they were able to begin, so they weren't really able to dive back into that curriculum uh, because they had to work with what they had. Um, they often had scattered schedules. Um, they didn't get to use their libraries to the fullest potential as much as everybody tried. Um, me personally, I was a librarian on a cart. And so they weren't able to learn, use those learning common spaces the way they're used to using them. So this year, the library and technology, the, the LITS team spent time looking back at the curriculum, um, testing what works, reflecting how they can modify their instructional practices, and just join the two subjects. We also spent a bit of time unpacking the standards. Now, when you think of this role, you wouldn't think that we have three sets of standards. But we have the ISTE standards for students, the AASL library standards, and the Massachusetts Digital Literacy Technology Standards. So it's three sets of standards to kind of determine, OK, what do we need to be teaching with students? Now, fortunately, there is some crossover with research and using technology tools, but also how to discern the, type, the kinds of information they need to get. So they are, so they develop a standards progression where we kind of laid out all of the, all of the standards we had to look at and then they figured out, okay, in kindergarten, this standard's going to be teacher modeled. In first grade, this standard is going to be introduced where you're gonna be learning this now. <coughs> For example, kindergarten, the teacher uses Google Slides. First grade, it's getting introduced. Um, just last week, I was in with a first grade class. A teacher invited me to come in and do a demo lesson. And I was teaching the first graders how to use graphic design in Google Slides to present their ideas for an animal research project. Um, so what we did, and after we did that, we started developing a scope and sequence. As you can see, it's starting, it's a little bit up there. Um, a lot of things that we focus on are the standards, the essential questions, and the transfer goals. What do we want these students to know by the time they get into middle school? And the same thing will happen with the middle school. What do, the student, what do we want the students to know by the time they get into high school? And same thing with high school. What do we want the students to know by the time they graduate? Um, so next up is the middle school digital literacy. Um, so I got to get together with all of them, with the, both the librarians and the tech integration specialists, because they all teach digital, digital literacy. Got together with them this summer, and they developed a working curriculum. Now I'm saying working curriculum, because this was the first time they developed it. And also, there's even just this year, every time that they teach a new unit, they're reflecting on that unit. Now, I could go into everything that's in it, but I'll just talk about some of the different topics. 
So the first one is getting set with technology. You guys got, like, you have your Chromebooks now. Let's see, this is how you use them. This is how you take care of them. This is what you don't do on them. This is what you do do on them. Um, understanding bias in media and plagiarism. Um, understanding the research process. One that's really important is online safety and responsible digital citizenship. And then finally, how to use those digital tools to present those ideas and create a digital portfolio. Um, and then the high school. Um, so the high school, very short. Um, so basically, it's all about reinforcing those skills. The technology integration specialists and library media specialists collaborate with teachers to teach skills on how to use the tools for research, how to use the digital tools to create portfolios and present their ideas, and reinforce the aspects of digital literacy and responsible use of the digital tools. So go on to the next slide. So one of the cool things that we have in this district is we have a lot of digital tools that go beyond just using the Chromebook. And this is where we're going to, you guys will have a chance to kind of play with a few things. I'm gonna drop something, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the Dash robots. I'm gonna put this guy in the middle here for you too. Thank you. So I'm sure they can hear me right now. Um, these are the Dash robots. Now, I wasn't gonna bring something in, but I had just programmed them for, so I'm gonna put this in the here. So I had just finished doing a pre-program for Madamit, because she asked for more. And you, you'll be, you'll, as I start talking to you. So, <laughs> So what you can do with this is this robot has different sensors. So if you wave your hand in front of like the two um, balls on the bottom, they'll start to move. You have to move them around so you can see your face. And then you can kind of play with them a little bit. Um, what I did was I called the kitten program. They're all turning to me because I'm talking. They're, they are voice activated as well. So I do what's called like a kitten program. And I'm sure you've seen the, the YouTube videos of the little kitten where like the person's playing, like tickling it, and it goes like this with their hand, and the kitten's like, woo! Well, you can do the same thing with these. Um, so if you want to turn it around so that the eye's facing you. Okay, you can get it like this. Okay, it's this eye's on the kid's eye on you. You're, you're confusing the connection. <laughs> Another thing, sorry. Yeah, they're very entertaining. And if you press the buttons on the top, they have three different programs that I've already pre-programmed into them. Um, what I often like to do, especially when you're introducing something like this, is you show the students what, they, what they're capable of and then you, so that they can see what an end product would be. They also do like to jump off tables. Um, so just be careful. <laughs> um, so they can see what an end product would be, and that's when they work towards building that end product. And that's when they start learning the basics of computer programming. Now, these use a programming language called Blockly, which is very similar to JavaScript, but it's more like puzzle pieces being put together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, if any of you are brave enough to pick one up, you can pick it up from one of the legs on the bottom. <laughs> there you go, Vanna. Hey. And then you can start <laughs> flipping it around. So this is where, so this is the kind of programming language that does eventually go into the robots that they create in high school. Um, it's very, oh. <laughs> uh -oh. 
curious to see if it would stop. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Stay. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> So the fortunate thing about these robots is that they are designed for kids. Um, they have a, you can drop them from essentially 10 feet about 7,000 times before they start to notice and that there's something wrong. Hmm. So they're drop resistant. Um, they are often very... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so they do use artificial, artificial intelligence. And what this does is it eventually gets the students used to writing in JavaScript and Python. And it also starts elevating what they understand with something like a Raspberry Pi or building a robot or computer themselves. So this is basically, <laughs> this is basically a baseline for it. And as you can see, it's a lot of fun. You guys want me to collect them and turn them off? Or want me to just leave them there for now? <laughs> Let's collect them. Yeah. I'll, I'll collect them. Keep going. I'll collect them. I'm having anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like it when you pick them up sometimes. And one of the programs I put in is when you pick it up, it starts running its wheels. Mm. Kind of like an, a, an animal would do, like when they want to be put down. Ah. I, was, I basically think of my daughter's bunny. Yeah, he's true. being picked up and... <laughs> All right, so other thing. <laughs> that one's a little upset. It's upset. <laughs> so other things that the students can use, um, once they get more into fifth grade, <laughs> once they go into fifth grade and some of fourth grade, they use a more advanced version of this, which is the Q. And with that, they actually start using the full programming language. So they do actually learn how to write JavaScript. They learn how to write Python. And it's even more interactive than these things. So the Q has even more capabilities than this one. So that's one of the things that we do. And that's how we introduce robotics. That's how we introduce coding. And that's how we also introduce like different aspects of engineering. Because the th another thing that's really cool is they can use the 3D printers. They can create different tools for these things. Um, one of the things that I did last year was they created a tool that had hand sanitizer on it. And then we programmed it to talk when it, whenever it felt someone approaching and said, please sanitize your hands. Like Cusco says, no touchy. <laughs> so that's what that was a, one of the uh, dashes that we had there. So that's one of the tools. Um, and then of course we have mouse and cheese, which is great for the for the younger students. But the dashes are designed for <clears throat> most for kindergarten. You can kind of show them and start beginning teaching them the language. But they also have set programs and set curriculum that comes with it. So when you open up the Dash EDU, it guides the students through an entire curriculum and a bunch of different challenges. So next, okay, so one of the cool, so we have the EV3s with the, with the robotics rally, which is much more advanced, but it uses the same kind of programming technology that these use. Another thing that we are starting to bring in is the Spheros, which is another kind of robot and allowing the students to look at the different robot applications um, for different fields that they might be interested in, such as music, um, helping others, and also bringing in the different STEM and design ideas. So I do have, I did get a full class set of Sphero bots, but one of my library, one of my lits requested that she have them this week because she had a whole bunch of great plans for them. So I brought little smaller versions um, so these are a smaller version. This is a mini version of the robots. And today I'm just going to have you guys use the, yeah. Um, <laughs> so any brave souls? Sure. Here you go. Let me just make sure this is lined up. I'm going to give you the iPad. 
So this is just the, so what this is is the remote that you're going to be playing with, but then what they do is they take the remote idea and then they start building the programming language behind it. I'm putting these guys on the board, but they do lots. Oh. So you can start Oh, moving. just be careful. Oh. No. You need a helmet. I can't see where it went. <laughs> yeah, it's they tend there. to disappear. But laptop. these are, okay. again, these are also drop resistant. Um, they can be thrown around. They're designed for students. That's cool. Right now we have a full class set for the, for the bigger ones so they don't get lost as easily. And one of the things that Harry my lits are very excited what to use them for great. is they're going to just kind of like finish out the year talking about STEM, talking about design, <laughs> but designing yeah, a right, sure, sure. mini golf course. And then they have to get these little golf balls. We have a little golf ball, golf ball skin for them. And they have to figure out how to do mini golf with actually programming one of these. <laughs> so I could probably just let it keep going. I'll let you guys keep playing, like continue on. <laughs> All right, so going on to the next slide is the different kinds of reality. So basically we have different Real systems. One is Makey Makey, where the students learn a lot about not only programming design, but also how to, do, how to work with circuits. So it does bring in the, the bigger fields of like electronics and understanding how it all works together. And one of the things about virtual reality, we were using Google Expeditions, but that has since gone to the wayside. Um, the, the VR sets that we have have become obsolete. So now we have a brand new set of the Expeditions 2.0 VR sets, so we can start bringing that back into the schools. Um, another thing that they like to do, uh, we have these for every single building. Now this is just a foam cube over here. Now, if I were to tell any of you, you can hold the sun in your hands, would you believe me? Hmm. Yes. So I'm gonna let you two, because you're not playing with anything right now. Okay. So you're gonna hold that in your hands, kind of hold it like this, and then she's gonna point the camera oh. a little bit closer. Okay. Where she's able to hold, he's able to, and then you can actually manipulate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. See. I see. <laughs> you want to oh. patch it down? Oh, it's, a, it's an augmented yeah. reality. So you're going to unhold it. So when the students are learning yeah. new concepts, they're learning about animals, or they're learning about the solar system, they have the opportunity to actually almost That's feel it cool. and notice what they're looking at. So what that cube allows them to do, it's a simple app. Um, there's a lot of different apps. There's apps about like understanding like the like anatomy of a human heart, that they can hold it up and they can manipulate That's the really human cool. heart to see the different parts of it. That's really amazing. <laughs> mm. One of the many tools we have. But the teachers use this, and the librarians use this, and the tech integration specialists use this a lot, um, just to kind of give the students a better perspective of what they're looking at. Instead of just reading something on a page or reading something on a website, it allows the students to really interact with what they have. Now you guys keep playing. I'll keep moving through the slides so I'm not taking up too much time. Right, so the next thing, now I apologize, I did not bring any drones with me. I am the worst drone pilot known to man, and even if, it's pre, even if I pre-program it, it will still end up in somebody's hair. So I did, not, so I did not bring any this time around, but eventually we'll have drones flying through this room. 
So basically the whole, so we have started introducing dro drones in education and starting to look at the real life application of how they're used, why they're used, and at TV, where'd where, where it go? Um, as you can see, they started using it for filming as well. But we're more so talking about how to program drones. Um, one of the cool activities that I'm hoping eventually we'll do is talking about pollinators and basically putting a felt on the bottom and having the drones bounce from flower to flower to see how much pollen they collect. <coughs> and basically the whole idea of that is that no, we, we need to keep the bees. Um, no technology is gonna be fully advanced enough to do that, especially when they start to realize how hard it is to program a drone to do that. So, and I forgot to mention 3D printing. 3D, you will, if you go into any of the libraries, you will see a 3D printer running nonstop. Um, students use the augmented 3D reality um, to create something in Tinkercad and then they can actually print it out and sometimes that tool is something for one of the um, spheros or it's a tool for one of these things or it's just something that they want to present their ideas in a different way. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so next is, as we know, MCAS is among us. Um, we are like in the thick of it. And basically, one of the cool things with, not really cool, but like one of the helpful things for MCAS is we have continued on with the MCAS website for the teachers and for the administrators. So everything they could possibly need is on that one website. Go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so next thing is our website. So one of the goals this year and moving into next year is cleaning up our <coughs> website. Um, and the website is one of, is basically the most commonly accessed platforms for our district and school information. Um, that's why I'm working towards ensuring that the website is easily accessible, easy to navigate, and it's more compatible for the different tools that we now use, because people do not just sit at a computer anymore. Nine times out of ten, they're on their cell phones and kind of make it more user-friendly in that realm. Um, I'm actually in contact with changing with Blackboard as of right now on even changing the, um, the overall template so that it's more user-friendly and it's also more ADA compliant. Um, next one, I promise I'm trying to be short, got more of the drones there. Um, so as you can see, we do have great tools. We have iPads. And those iPads and the Apple TVs and the um, Macs are all great tools for the district where you can, I know EdTV uses them. Uh, they're used all over the place and where else? Digital signage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so basically there's one way that we need to manage them and that is through the Mosul MDM. Um, they just gotten started with it a few years ago, but now Mosul has become even more intuitive. So even when I was trying, even when I had those iPads, those iPads are technically <clears throat> programmed for a separate school. I was able to go into Apple School Manager, grab an app, put it into the Mosul Manager, and it automatically updated and added to the iPads that you're using right now. So it allows us to kind of monitor everything, track what's going on. Um, right now we have 1,060 devices on the Mosul Manager and I can manage every single one of them from my computer. Mm -hmm. um, go to the slides, next slide. So one-to-one -one student Chromebooks, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail, but we are now a one-to-one -one district thanks to COVID. And now we have, I don't know how many Chromebooks nice circulating throughout. 7, we have about 7,000 Chromebooks circulating throughout the district. And now that we are all back in school, we're working on managing those Chromebooks, and I've been importing all the Chromebooks into our library manager, Destiny, um, which, and so now we can use Destiny for any, like basically using it more towards its potential instead of just maintaining books. So we have, so we're now one-to-one -one students use the technology, like, use the Chromebooks constantly. Um, it has just become a natural part of their learning. Um, finally, libraries. So as you within this role, um, former, formerly Julia didn't have the whole library role, but because of my background with running a school library, running a district library program, um, I now also manage the libraries. So basically what we're working on is 
basically revamping the library space um, because it was kind of like put to the side last year where like everyone managed as best they could to circulate the materials but it wasn't used to its greatest potential. What I'm showing is a sample of one of the elementary libraries where I've been working with her to kind of make the library more user friendly. So it's not just you walk in and there's a whole bunch of books and you have no right. idea where to go. Um, so this library, what she did with the easy reader books, or like as we remember them as picture books, everything's still organized by the author's last name, but instead of having to go through A, B, A, C, A, D, it's just all letter A, goes in one spot, the kids love it because they can find what they want. Um, and then same thing with the nonfiction, yes, we, st yes, we still have Dewey, but we're making Dewey a lot more user friendly. For example, she knows that sharks is a big topic that kids love to research. So she put all the shark books in one part. She has pictures so that the little kids don't even have to read to be able to see it. They know that the shark books are right there. And basically it's becoming more of a common space and a learning commons and not just like a little library. So the idea is to basically build a library so they're the central hub of the school. <clears throat> and that's it. Next. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan McLean. I'm a technology systems engineer for the district. Uh, my half of the technology is the hardware network infrastructure. Um, I'll just apologize up front. I have no robots, no videos. <laughs> I hate to disappoint. But, um, <laughs> I'd like to start my presentation off with a quick who we are, my department, what we do. Um, we're made up of five technicians, myself, a junior technician, admin assistant. Uh, we are housed and based out of the technology center. Technicians are assigned to rotations of buildings, um, six month rotations. The two techs at the high schools um, they have a single school based on the size of the school and the technology involved. Some of the things we do, we maintain staff devices, student devices. We have about 10,000 devices in total between those two. Um, phone intercom systems, we're up to 1,234 phones. We're 90 plus photocopiers. We're in charge of ID badges building access, programming card access, uh, network email onboarding, network equipment, firewall servers, data switches, APs, security cameras, et cetera. Um, there's et cetera in another slide because the list is endless. Some of these things, as technology has evolved, um, have come over from the maintenance department. Phone intercoms, um, building access, security cameras never fell under um, technology. Um, so as technology evolved, they landed on my lap. Lucky me. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight a few things tonight. One-to-one -one student devices, photocopy replacements, and cyber security. One-to-one -one student devices, we mentioned previously, is about 7,000 student devices. Grades K through five, those Chromebooks stay in the classrooms, they do not go home. Grades six through 12, the Chromebooks do go to and from school. Uh, students are expected to bring them in fully charged. So what we've seen after the first year of the one-to-one -one deployment, we've had approximately 630 broken devices or tickets, uh, 270 broken screens. Of those screens, uh, most were accidental, uh, typically caused by being a backpack, student getting on the bus, having a backpack full of books and a Chromebook in it and breaking the screen. What we did run into at the middle schools was some malicious damage to the Chromebooks. There was a TikTok video going around at one point with um, challenging students who cut through chairs with the cord on their surgical mask that they're wearing. And when they get bored with that, they decided to start trying to cut through Chromebooks. And uh, some were pretty successful. It was pretty surprising what you can cut with a little plastic cord. But. Um, same time with the one-to-one -one Chromebooks, we rolled out a software package called GoGuardian. What that does, it allows us to content filter students at school and at home. It provides uh, the ability to locate lost or stolen devices. It also helps us be alerted to possible activity that might be self-harm. Um, 
Just doing look up weapons. Yeah, I mean, is a teacher component too? I can let uh, Miss Ware address that too. Um, so one of the cool things about Go Guardian is that it allows the teachers to have a better control of what's happening in their classroom. So if this is pretty much an essential tool when you're teaching middle school and high school, but I always found it to be extremely helpful in the elementary school, especially when you have the littles, as I call them, like the kindergarten, first grade. Because one of the cool things about Go Guardian is the teacher's able to see this, like all of the students' screens and say, for example, they're going on to a new subject or our wonderful students are there for the first week and they're still learning how to like even pull up websites and even pull up their clever page. The students are then, the teacher is then able to essentially push out the proper website or the proper program that they want the students to be on and then it shows right up on that student computer. Um, the teacher is also able to pause what's happening at the computer so that they can, like say for example, teach something or they want the student's attention. They're able to individually help certain students. Um, for example, they could notice a student struggling, send them a quick message like, hey, do you need help? And either get up and help the student or they can <coughs> message back and forth. But those messages only go between the students and the teachers. Um, they're also able to use them, use GoGuardian to just kind of keep all the students on the same page. Um, one of the things is students often like to, and I do the same thing too, um, but they often like to go into new tabs, especially when they're not supposed to because they're supposed to be listening to their teacher. The teacher is able to limit the amount of tabs that they have open. They're able to limit the exact websites that they want the students to be on. They create scenes. It's, there's a lot of really cool features on the things that they can do with it. Thank you. Photocopy replacement. So as I mentioned previously, there's 90 plus photocopiers in the school district. Uh, about a year ago, the business office talked to me about the photocopiers, so they'd like to centralize them, manage it locally, uh, centrally rather. Would I be interested? I didn't really take that as a choice. Um, so <laughs> I now have photocopiers. <laughs> So we, so far we've deployed 26 new photocopiers. Come July 1st, we have another 33 district-wide that will not be covered on a contract that are uh, in need of replacement. I am working with the administration to uh, roll out a plan to replace those. And this all came from basically we're phasing out all the individual um, printers that at one time the model was every classroom had its own printer. We've gotten away from that due to the cost of maintenance and supplies. And what these new photocopies allow is every uh, Plymouth staff member with an ID badge can scan a print from any location they're at. Cybersecurity, the hot topic. So um, some of the goals here is assessing and determining our cybersecurity risk and what that is is me taking a look at our exposures in the cloud and on premise establishing a plan to uh, provide a more secure environment, and regularly, to, regularly uh, monitoring everything from logins to files that leave this district, leave our email domain, um, all kinds of different things in that sense. Um, we recently had a phishing email breakout that was controlled in short time. I mean, my biggest obstacle is the human factor. Um, I've tried to convince people many times not to open emails. It doesn't seem to work. Uh, some excuses I get are I was distracted. I was tired. Um, I wasn't paying attention. Um, I mean, the key to this whole thing is understanding why the errors were made and find ways to um, avoid similar situations in the uh, future. So. And next steps, upcoming <coughs> projects. So um, hopefully I can convince Ms. Ware to do a little demonstration here, but we're replacing the middle school projectors this summer with 75 inch touch panels, which you see an 86 inch behind me. So this is, the, so this is one of the, I, I guess I can't really hear this, so. Okay. You, you should be okay. I think. Okay, um, so this is an example of the touch panel that's going into the middle schools. So basically what this is, is a giant touchscreen computer. It 
advantages of the keyboard, as you can see, them, I have the mouse over there, but it's also touch screen. Um, this one was put a little high, so I have to get on my toes to get to the top of it. But what it does is it allows the teachers to simply log in with their Google account, and then they can pull up any documents. It goes with the Elmo cameras, that the document cameras that are in every classroom. So they're able to pull things up from the document camera. For example, if they are, if they have a piece of paper or they have like a, an assignment that they have on the document camera, they can go over here, they can click on the whiteboard, and then they can then use this as a whiteboard. So they can either use their finger or they can use one of the handy pens. Mm -hmm. And then what they can do after that is this can then be recorded or discarded and then it creates a and basically goes right into their Google account as a new screenshot. They're also able to use different platforms. So this is the OPS platform. This has a computer in the back of it. Most of the ones that, the, that we are putting into the classrooms will not have that computer. This way, the teachers have more flexibility to use their own computers and their own devices. Another cool thing about it is this also does direct casting. So they can use their Chromebook, they can use an iPad, they can even use their cell phones to cast onto here, and then it's fully touch interactive. So I'll go here first, and then go back to the OPS system. And so you can see how easy it is to switch between the different systems. So basically the idea of this is it will re replace the projector and also give the students more chance to get in front of the board. For example, um, I'm gonna go this real, this is really simple stuff over here. Um, so this is, Scratch. This is a uh, coding for the littles, <coughs> but what they're able to to do is you can have you can actually split the screen, so you have two kids working on the same thing, and then the students can walk up to it. They can manipulate it just with the finger touches. <laughs> so not only is it the teacher up there showing the students, but the students are able to interact with it, and because this because everyone has the Chromebooks students are able to see the same exact thing that they have in front of them. And yes, Go Guardian works on this too. Um, and pretty much any system that you have will work on this, which is really cool. And it also has like, it has great features where you could, it, um, it's like very loud. So if you want to show like an instructional video, if you want to put something on brain pop, um, it, it allows them to do that too. So this is just like, th there, there's so much more. And the cool thing about it, extremely durable. Hmm. Um, it's just, and even the stand is designed for kids kind of climbing on it. Um, one thing that like if you put it in the elementary schools there, even for the, for the middle schools, I know like my daughter started middle school, she was pretty short. They are able to essentially climb onto here and interact with it as well. So like everything else we have, it can withstand what the kids come at, come at it with. Thank you. We opted for um, stand mounting versus wall mounting too for flexibility. So. Yeah, so you don't need to do anything with it. All you have to do is plug it in and it starts right up. So some of the other projects, uh, we're at a point where we are having to start full circle again on our phone systems and replace some of the oldest voice over IP systems. Uh, we're gonna continue deployment of our photocopiers and continue to strengthen our cybersecurity posture and work to educate all staff on safe practices to avoid data breaches. Um, I'm really gonna make a push this coming year to we're looking at some software that would allow us to generate our own phishing emails, uh, take statistics on people who maybe fall for the email, um, offer training, you know, just really, uh, um, just really work to educate them not a slap on the wrist, but just really kind of help them understand, you know, what to look for, and, that, and et cetera, because <clears throat> the list never stops, so, yeah. yeah. So that is all I have. Thank you. If you have any questions, happy.
Ms. Haywood. Um, thank you both for your very thorough um, presentations. Um, I was just at, going to ask a question regarding like the data, like data breaches and or um, cybersecurity. Is the is the system um, encrypted? The data that is in house is encrypted. So we, we only keep um, anything that is data sensitive, HR, everything else, all sits in house and that is encrypted. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. But I can assure you every file that is out there, like I said, in our Google domain, is being monitored okay. all the time. Um, I've sent emails out to a few different staff members that have emailed credit card information personally, mm -hmm. tax returns wow. that you just don't want. And then also in terms of like this phishing, I, um, uh, for instance, at the place that I work, um, they do have a tendency to do, they'll send out mm -hmm. these. Um, and so that will be, you said, implemented. Um, so uh, Mr. Trophy and I had talked about implementing some, kind of like we had the mandatory videos to at the beginning of the school year, we're obligated to watch and sign off on. We talked about having some sort of training videos for cyber security or awareness and doing the same type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to, to as Mr. McLean said, to educate the, the staff, because this is something that's not very familiar to a lot of teachers, mm -hmm. but to educate them on cybersecurity and how certain actions can lead to, you know, very prog problematic things, not only for the district, but for themselves as individuals as well. Yeah. So and to do some training and some practice, I think, yeah. is certainly worthwhile. Yeah, and, and for the information, I mean, I would think... Yeah in terms of the information that we do house with mm -hmm. students and or personnel. Absolutely. Yeah. And to add on to that, because we are a Google district and we use Google Suite and we do, we have the paid version, do, Google does have extra settings in place to ensure security for all people who have a Plymouth Public Schools or student at Plymouth Public Schools um, log, Google login. So all, that's, all of the files in there are protected as well. I mean, just to mention, go back to where I talked about monitoring everything. When that phishing email outbreak happened, I immediately saw logins coming from Nigeria. Wow. So that immediately throws up a flag, and I have the ability to control that moving forward. So. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So we put the two-point authentication in place for to access. Yeah. Yeah, not all my, my stuff is well received. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Pisano? Okay, Alan. Yeah. Is there anything with regards to cybersecurity that you would be able to do better if you had additional funding? And the reason I ask is obviously there's been plenty of successful <clears throat> ransomware attacks, and I'd mm -hmm. rather spend you know ten thousand to prevent you know being ransomed for a hundred thousand. So, yep. for example, but are there are, are, do you feel you're because of your size of your budget you're limited, or are there things you would do better if you could? Yeah, I think there's always room for improvement. So I'm looking at um, piece of software that would have a cost associated with it. Um, Dr. Rogers doesn't know about it yet, but um, yeah, I'm near end of evaluation, <laughs> which would be key. I'd be looking at contracting some, um, some companies out there to be, do penetration testing. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're paying a hacker mm -hmm. to try to hack into your system, so I'd also entertaining that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, would, I mean, nothing's 100%, so of course, I'm just yeah, trying to... No, but I would definitely be supportive. I think the committee probably would, too, because like I said, this is more of an yeah. insurance policy to me. Cost, right. cost more to not do it than to yep. put preventative measures in place. Yep, and we do backup on-site, off-site, um, so ransomware. We have endpoint security in place that constantly monitors for ransomware, immediately shut down an endpoint if it senses something. Uh, firewalls doing the same thing, so. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Dr. Sorensen. I just want to say that you two put a lot of work in this presentation. You brought a lot of information to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add it's a great presentation. I like the uh, toys. <laughs> um, still a kid at heart, so it's, uh, it's quite fun. But it's so funny. When I first got elected to the school committee in 2009, there was very limited technology it was. Yeah. in the classroom and so forth. And how where it's come today is, is amazing. So. I know it's a lot of work, but we really appreciate everything you do. Thank so, you. So, Ms. Morgan, if I could add to that, too, um, come this September, I'll have 27 years in here. Wow. And I've pretty much built the technology department from ground up, so talk about changes. I mean, it's incredible how things have you know, evolved Evolution. and what we've got now for the students. It's really, yeah. 
super exciting. So, so absolutely re related yeah. to that, if I may, um, we talked about drones. We're actually uh, we'll be incorporating drones into our uh, facilities management and CCTE mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of which is a great skill for um, that industry because there are a lot of times where they, instead of getting up back up on a roof or going through a building um, <coughs> physically, using that technology to to evaluate the conditions before you know mm. working on or making recommendations so that's something that we'll be rolling out next year we we're in the process of purchasing that too yeah. through some grant funds any other questions or comments thank you very much thank you thank you both um dr cameron would like to take a quick five minute break if we could for um your update so we should be back here by 20 of okay very good that was great.
All right, well, we're back um, from our short break, and we'll move right into um, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I'm uh, desperately in need of a, an eye doctor appointment because I'm having a, this print is pretty big and I'm still having a hard time seeing it. So my apologies for my Join cheaters. Join the club. Uh, my gosh. Um, so just a, a few things, I'll try to be uh, brief but thorough. Uh, we had a recent meeting with the commissioner to discuss accountability measures. Uh, it was a remote meeting just about a week or so ago. Um, they're looking at um, some relief from accountability measures for this year, which have been approved thus far at the federal level. As you know, we're all obligated, we're, we're mandated by federal regulations, and the state interprets those and gets approval for their accountability standards that are in place. So um, they would like to use, the Department of Education would like to use the 21-22 school year to reset baselines for accountability and not focus on district targets. That's been approved at the federal level thus far. It's just a matter of bringing it before the state uh, department and they feel that that will be approved um, you know, soon, soon enough. Um, they're also asking about recalculating chronic absenteeism for this year in terms of looking at that, from raising it from 10% to 20% of days in attendance, mm -hmm. given it, taking into consideration the fact that that COVID absences are still part of absences. Um, so just giving some leniency for that as we sort of try to transition, you know, back to um, a more typical school year. Uh, so the second step, as I said, is to regulate uh, state regulations and DESE's actively uh, working on that and we should get more information soon and I'll share that with you as soon as I get that. Um, Teacher Appreciation Week was the week of May 2nd. Um, I just wanna take a moment to thank all of the PTAs, um, the different businesses in town uh, for just the tremendous outpouring of support that they showed to all of our schools and our educators um, throughout that week. It was really special having walked through a, a number of the buildings to see just the level of attention that they put um, to recognize our educators and all of our support staff. Uh, so appreciative for their kindness and generosity uh, that they, sh they showed and I just wanted to to express my appreciation for that. We also celebrated uh, School Nurses Day recently. So US National School Nurses Day is observed on the Wednesday during National School Nurse Week um, in May every year. And it took place on May 11th, which was just a week or so ago. Uh, great <coughs> time for us to honor our nurses who have been instrumental, not only through COVID in, in recent years, but really an instrumental part of our teams when we look at uh, the whole child. And um, I just uh, can't say enough about about them and what they do for us. Um, coming from a family with nurses, great appreciation for what they do, but um, what they bring to, to, to the schools is just great. And uh, so we celebrate them last week as well. Another very busy week of celebrations. You heard some from um, our student reps today, but Ed TV, as we said, we'll have the Ellie's uh, tomorrow. They officially start at seven o'clock, but if you, got the, if you were available, I think at 6.30, there'll be some opportunities beforehand. Uh, our vocational showcases, South High School is Wednesday, North High School is uh, Thursday to celebrate our seniors and all of their accomplishments. We have our North Acapella Festival um, on Friday at 7 p.m. It's another, act, another uh, opportunity to, to celebrate this spring. And then as I believe was said by um, Justin that our South High School will be doing Chicago, the high school edition. Uh, Friday and Saturday. Look forward to attending that as well. Um, and then last week, we also had the opportunity to recognize and celebrate our senior biomed students Monday and Tuesday last week at <coughs> North and so South, respectively. I, was, I didn't have an opportunity to go to North. I know that many people here did. Uh, did have an opportunity to go to South, but just a wonderful, wonderful program that's been around for many, many years. Um, and just to see the level of dedication that the students have, but also our staff as well and I do want if our if Seth if you could pull up a video that that I shared with you all <coughs> just as I um, introduced this piece which is related so um, this was shared with me shared with me by um, Mrs. Reardon so the 1-8 foundation and its program uh, Mass STEM, STEM hub and its partners from PBL works are developing a 10-hour applied learning experience for Massachusetts STEM week and the challenge that they're grappling with is 
with the question, how can we prepare and inspire people in Massachusetts to pursue STEM careers that have the greatest potential for impact? So this, in this STEM week challenge, students are, are charged to research in-demand in STEM careers that interest them and reach out to professionals in those fields. So this challenge was actually inspired by the work of our biomed students at Plymouth North High School and the staff, which uh, seniors connect directly with biomed professionals to learn about their careers and pathways. Uh, so the 1-8 Foundation and PBL Works, their team was at North High School for about nine or 10 hours recently to develop a film, uh, a, a video I should say, um, which was, um, in, incorporates uh, Miss Nancy Rozak and her students, many of her students, and they're now using this video to share with educators across the state who are preparing to undertake STEM <coughs> Week Challenge. And it's a, it's a wonderful <coughs> video, and I just wanted to show you that briefly if we could pull that up. Students typically will be exposed to careers from each of the units and they're told to look them up on the internet, find out what they do. Those are pretty boring. <laughs> it's, it's not getting the connection with a real person. What motivated me to start a career connections program was the interest that students had in the different careers. They really didn't understand what the careers were or how many were out there in the STEM field. The first part was to actually connect with an industry professional that you felt the career was interesting and that you might pursue right. yourself. So this is Miss Raymond. She is a respiratory therapist. And if you wouldn't mind starting by explaining what you do at your job. We met with a wide variety of medical professionals. I got a whole new perspective on different types of jobs. The second part of their uh, project was to do a recording. They had to base it on the career again and tie it in with their professional interview. So I'd say neurologist is a specialized doctor that deals with you know, problems with the brain. Students would make connections that I didn't expect. Find an adult in your life that, you, that knows a lot of people and ask them if they know anybody who knows anybody. Go to a doctor's office and just ask them anybody if anybody would be willing to do that. Don't be afraid to just send an email to somewhere. The students would run into problems when they were trying to connect with professionals. I don't think they understood that not all adults will return your calls. They're busy, but they pushed through and they all found somebody. And I think it showed them that if with a little persistence, you can do this. It's important for students to learn networking skills because typically, that's how you get a job nowadays. I got the idea of inviting the athletic trainer because he worked alongside my surgeon due to a sports-related injury, and that's kind of where I became interested in sports medicine. And then Sandro did a project on an endocrinologist, and I realized that that is exactly what I want to do. When she heard what the endocrinologist did and what the job entailed, it really pulled to her. It was pretty powerful. You kind of go in having these preconceived notions about these careers, and the professionals do a really good job of either like building upon those or breaking them down and showing you like a whole new understanding of the career. Getting to talk to uh, a real biomedical engineer, it really gave me the, you know, the confidence that like I was already leaning towards going to Wentworth, and it gave me a lot of a lot of things I didn't know about the industry, like how interconnected it is around the globe, and I I just found that really interesting. I think they got a real authentic view of that profession, not a, a canned piece that was put on an internet. Even when the Google Meets were over and the professionals were gone, they kept asking questions. That was just so cool to see them excited about their future. It opened up my eyes to a whole different perspective um, in the inside part of the job, not just what I see on the outside. I think the more professions that students see in any 
field would be beneficial for them because they don't know what jobs are out there. And we go to school to get a job. <laughs> so I think that the students now have a better understanding of what's ahead of them and what they could be and that they can change their mind too. It wasn't even a school project. It was genuinely like a plan for the future, which made it super cool because now I kind of have an idea of what I want to be and that might change, but as of right now, I really like what came out of this project. Thank you very much, Ms. Raymond, for talking with us today. Thank you. So as I said, um, Mrs. Redden shared that with me Friday afternoon, and I thought I just had to share that with all of you, so this will be officially kicked off across the state uh, for Mass STEM Week Challenge. Um, just a f uh, one more th uh, piece of information, or two, I should say. So next, our next meeting, June 6th, we will be doing a presentation. Our family engagement team, uh, part of our strategic plan is about engaging families and looking at, particularly around um, the family community resource uh, model that we've been we've been talking about. Uh, we've been as a, as a as a as a standing administrative group uh, or team of teachers as well. Uh, been looking at this, getting a lot of feedback, doing a lot of research since August. So we'll be doing a presentation to uh, to to this committee at the next meeting. Uh, so a lot of great ideas and suggestions on how we can move forward to that ultimate fruition of a a full fledged uh, family resource center. Um, and I'll share. Uh, my other ideas um, during that meeting. And lastly, um, as you know, we, we've been um, searching for a, a new s secretary to the school committee. Um, we successfully obtained a very um, competent and uh, <laughs> sought after uh, professional within our organization. So Janine, if you could just come up for two seconds just so I can introduce you formally. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Janine Daly. Yeah, you can just, just sit. I did warn her that I was going to introduce her. So Jean, Janine Daly currently works for the Special Education Department. Uh, we're super excited to have her uh, joining us um, and, and joining all of you in, in supporting the school committee, as well as a whole host of other things that we'll be throwing at <laughs> Janine. But we're in the process of onboarding her, her right now and getting her the training. Um, she's registered with MASC and just getting familiar with um, the role as we transition. Certainly, special education department is very busy right now too. So her official start date will be July one. But Janine's already been connecting and and interacting and get ready. So I just wanted to, to introduce Janine. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Good. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's all I have this evening. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next, we have retirements, Mr. Chofi. Yes, good evening. I do have five members to share with you that are retiring. Uh, one will just be here coming up shortly next week. Uh, Phyllis Westcott, security receptionist for the past 16 years and eight months at West um, Elementary School. Uh, we have Mary Jane Banville, who is a moderate special needs reading teacher, 36 years and seven months at Plymouth North High School, will retire at the end of this year. Uh, Lynn Finley, security receptionist with just under 30 years at Indian Brook <laughs> Elementary School, will also retire at the end of June. Susan Martin, moderate special needs teacher with 22 years at Plymouth South High School for the end of this year. And Carolyn Whittle, assistant principal, Plymouth South High School, 35 years, will also retire at the end of June. Excellent, Dr. Sorensen. Well, let me say on behalf of the school committee, those individuals have given most of their adult life to Plymouth Public <laughs> Schools. And on behalf of the school committee, we want them to know we truly appreciate that commitment and we wish them the best in their retirement. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, we have the superintendent's um, evaluation. Um, so um, I'm, I'm stepping in for Chairman Savory. Um, she put this together based on the um, evaluations done by all the members. We submitted it to Chairman Savory, and she um, uh, prepared this um, for Dr. Campbell. Um, she's joining us remotely, so 
Um, but I wanted to um, thank her for her efforts in putting this together. And I will um, go over um, the, uh, briefly the evaluation and some of the comments by some of the members. Um, let me just go back here to the beginning. Bear with me one second. All right, here we go. All right. So um, this is the um, end of cycle um, evaluation report for Dr. Campbell um, as prepared by Chairman uh, Savory, Chairperson Savory, excuse me. Um, uh, the overall assessment for Dr. Campbell is proficient. Um, in all categories, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. Uh, let me read a, a summary uh, from uh, Chairperson Savory. Um, Dr. Campbell took on some very big goals this year, which have either been met or have significant progress. He provided a great deal of information to demonstrate his uh, work on each goal. Uh, Dr. Campbell is a top quality um, superintendent and his strengths far outnumber his weaknesses. He has fostered an administration, administrative team that is one of the best in the Commonwealth and has enabled them to do what they do best, which is to uh, assess the needs of our students and install best practices. This year has been again uh, a year that has unfortunately been unlike any other, but it's good to see movement back to normalcy for the uh, Plymouth Public Schools, and it gives great hope for the next year. The past few years have been challenging for most seasoned superintendents, and it, to have started this role in such turmoil and uncertainty with mo, uh, minimum harm done to the district speaks to his capacity as a leader. Uh, Dr. Campbell has set high standards for the district, and he continues to move forward and to strengthen relationships uh, uh, across our community. He continues to make sure that our students are safe and that the rigor and expectations are set high for our students. His leadership team, he continues to focus on the whole child to make sure that they are producing well-rounded global citizens, not just focused on academics. So, I mean, there's a lot more in here, but uh, uh, I, I would like to say I'd like to thank Dr. Campbell for his efforts again. Um, you know, this is a difficult job regardless, and uh, under these times, it's even more difficult, and I think he's done an excellent job with both um, his team and with our school district. And, um, and again, um, the, um, the evaluation is available on Electronic School Board, school board but I just wanted to pass on our thanks for, um, for this past year. Dr. Campbell. Through you, Ms. Morgan. Uh, thank you very much. I, re I really appreciate um, all the feedback. Um, and certainly, you know, my goals and my evaluation are a, a collective, you know, effort uh, for sure. Uh, it has been a very trying couple of years. Um, that being said, I think we're all working really hard, um, really trying to stay true to the mission of our district, keeping everyone's best interest in, in mind and, and the core values that that shape our school district. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We can never be satisfied with the work, so there's always, there's always room for improvement, um, even in places where we continue to shine. And I think you saw some of the examples here this evening, but there's always room for improvement. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look at the work that we do with a critical lens, and I think we've been doing that really well as a team um, when we get together and you know getting back to some of my goals this year really looking at um, best practices having conversations as a team but really trying to you know be very focused and deliberate and and intentional in 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 what we do through these very complex um and contested times to be quite honest still um but i, I do appreciate i appreciate this committee trem tremendously uh, and your leadership and your support. Um, I've been here for 14 years now um, as a, you know, in, in 22 years as a resident and proud to say that, you know, my own children and, and relatives have gone through this school system. So it's very um, near and dear to me, but I just thank you for um, your support. And again, I, this work couldn't be done without the collective efforts of the 1,000 
plus staff members that we have in this in this district. So thank you. Any comments um, from committee members? Oh, um, um, Chairperson Savory. Me. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to thank the committee members because um, one thing that Dr. Sorensen said when I first became chair is that this is a really difficult task and probably one of the hardest things that we've had to do as chair. Um, and he's not joking. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. And I really, um, I really feel like all the committee members put so much effort into it. Those, you know, comments, everything was so thorough and well thought out. And it is really hard to capture everybody's um, thoughts and sentiments exactly. So I tried my hardest. And I just wanted to let everybody know that, I, you know, I tried to, you know, put everybody's comments in there. And um, it's, I look at the ratings, I, I average them, you know, there's some that fall above and some that fall behind. And when you read the individual comments, you can see that. So I just wanted to thank the committee members for getting them to me all on time and for spending so much time on them and congratulate Dr. Campbell for his job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, well said. <clears throat> all right. Our next agenda item is related. <coughs> Um, is to um, the superintendent's annual performance incentive. This is an action item. Um, do we have a motion? Dr. Sorensen. Having received a positive annual performance in accordance with section 7.5 of the contract with the superintendent and the committee, uh, I move that the annual performance incentives be approved. I second. We have a second by Mr. Pisano. Any discussion? Will this be done through? It doesn't seem to be coming up as, a, as, a, as an electronic school board option, even okay. though I'm logged in. So All I right. guess it would we'll, be. We'll take a roll call. Um, Mrs. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Pisano? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Dr. Sorensen? Yes. And I vote yes. And um, Ms. Savory? I vote yes. <laughs> All right. It's approved. Thank you. Excellent. Well deserved. All right. Um, reports and proposal from committee members. Do we have any reports or proposals? Dr. Sorensen. Uh, I'm going to follow uh, Dr. Uh, Campbell's superintendent's report and make a comment about our community and its great contribution to public education. And the story goes like this, that one, my second oldest is a special needs teacher at Plymouth North High School. And I was talking to some students who, who struggle a bit uh, socioeconomically about the prom and he was talking to those students, three of them, and he was going to make the rounds of his brother's houses, including my own, to find clothes that they could wear, because well, you know, everybody's got clothes in their closet. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to one of the administrators, and the administrator wanted, said, why don't you call Diamond Formal Wear downtown Plymouth to see what they can do for these three students. And he made the phone call to Diamond Formal Wear on Court Street, and they said, bring the students down. Mm. And those three students who want to go to the prom for the first time in their life went and got pictures of their girls' dresses and met their parents at, at uh, Diamond Formal Wear and they were, and they were fitted with tux, mm. each of them tuxes. For the, I think it's such, a good, it's such a good feeling story of how our community gives to our students. I, I agree. It touches me. Mm. Excellent story. Excellent story. Gives us faith for sure. Um, all right, next up uh, we have um, Plymouth Building Committee. Uh, Mr. Pisano. Sure. <clears throat> Bear with my scratchy throat today. <clears throat> uh, so there are three main topics at uh, last week's meeting. Uh, we covered uh, the DPW's uh, master plan for a new DPW facility, uh, work on the fire stations, and our school roof projects. So on the DPW side, um, they're in kind of the uh, requirements gathering phase, doing kind of a needs assessment of what they're facility needs ideally be um, you know as part of the design process um, so I'll, there'll be a lot more activity on that over the next uh, year uh, <clears throat> on the fire station side uh, station two which is West uh, Plymouth uh, phase one of that project is uh, going to be finished up next month um, and then phase two which is the true major renovation uh, phase um, will basically go to uh, bid in June and that'll be about a 12 month project so by next summer hopefully those folks uh, manning that station will have a uh, pretty much a brand new fire station finally. 
Uh, Station 5, which is uh, Cedarville, that's kind of in the uh, design uh, process, but getting pretty far along. That was approved at uh, town meeting, so they just need to actually you know, finalize the designs and you know, go into the bidding stage. Um, and then stage, uh, Station 4, which is uh, the Bourne Road uh, Fire Station in South Plymouth, that one is getting close to finalizing a new location. Uh, on the school roof side are uh, the West Federal Furnace Indian Brook uh, projects. The bids for those uh, came in last, uh, uh, I think it was Wednesday, and we get, received two uh, good bids, and uh, we've accepted one from a firm called Greenwood. Um, they actually did the library and South High School as well. Um, it was about a million and a half more than we estimated, um, but within the contingency amount, so it's actually within what we budgeted. And given all the supply chain issues that are going on in the construction industry, it actually came in pretty much uh, at what we would have expected, um, given where we are. So really not, not that bad. And again, it's within budget. Um, and the town's only paying 50% of that, so that over budget piece is a lot smaller than it sounds. <clears throat> uh, on Nathaniel Morton side, uh, bids came in uh, last uh, Thursday, so our uh, f uh, district facilities director is in the process of evaluating those. I don't know if any decisions have been made yet, but that's probably uh, imminent. So. Excellent. Thank you. All right. It's certainly busy. The facilities department is very busy. <laughs> Project. All right. Personnel report, Mr. Chofi. Uh, this evening, I just have two classified appointments to share with you, uh, as well as Two short-term parental leaves were approved. Uh, we did receive 12 resignations. I can share with you that our building principals and assistant principals are working tirelessly right now, hiring on staff for next year. So I imagine over the next month or so, I'll be sharing a lot larger group of certificated and uh, classified staff brought on for the next school year. This is a busy time of year for you. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, any um, old business to bring up to the committee? No? How about new business? All right. All right. Next up, we have the consent agenda. Do we have anything that any of the members need to be taken out or edited? If not, I entertain a motion. All motion to approve the consent agenda as is. Motion by Mr. Pisano. Do we have a second? Second, second by uh, Mrs. Jackson. Um, we'll take a vote. Are we um, can we do our electronic school board or we're going to do we'll, yeah, so do the roll, we'll, roll call. Okay. Um, Mrs. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Pisano? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Ms. Savory? Yes. And I vote yes. So with that. I'll adjourn the meeting at 9.09 p.m. <laughs>